Hey folks, it's me, Stephen, and as I announced in many of the previous episodes, well, I'm currently on vacation, and I'm not going to be back until July. But don't go anywhere, because you're still going to get an episode of this podcast. It just won't be hosted by me. Instead, it's going to be hosted by a truly amazing individual, or a group of truly amazing individuals. Just, you know... Don't go falling in love with them and leave me, okay? Anyway, see y'all in July. Boys and girls, your attention, please. Presenting a new exciting radio program featuring the thrilling adventures of an amazing and incredible personality. Hey, testing. Okay, so much like Richard Linklater uh, did with Boyhood, I just, I have a feeling what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the next 25 to 30 to 35 years um, collating material that I can then use to do dream movie castings before they're actually out. Um, I'm going to start this in the off chance that an old uh, gypsy that I think I accidentally made thinner, um, she gave me uh, these cast lists for all these movies out to 2031. And so I am going to just cherry pick some of the, the recordings I've made and we'll see how right I was and I don't know maybe have a little fun along the way anyway um, consider that a cold open uh, my name is the voice and I want to welcome you to uh, just another fanboy with that said let's go ahead and start having some fun oh by the way if you um, if you want to call in uh, I need to check with Steven but I will put the call-in number in the comments Uh, Thank you, and uh, back to the show. Okay, I just want to point out, I'm doing this intro uh, from a kayak uh, on a lake in uh, North Texas. It's actually pretty cool. Um, I would highly recommend this way to end a day. Um, It kind of puts me in a good mood to do some podcasting. You know what I mean? It just makes you feel good on the inside. That's what the voice is all about, Um, feeling good on the inside. Um, I know it's better to look good than to feel good, but, um, I, right now I am going to worry about, uh, function over form and, uh, dang the torpedoes full speed ahead without any more delays. Let's do a show. Mental note, uh, insert open here. Uh, good luck finding music that isn't owned by somebody I don't think I have enough time to make my own uh, yeah, take care of that before uh, you send it to Stephen uh, end note and one more sorry about the interruption and one more time let's start the show just another fanboy oh excuse me what I meant to say was welcome to the show. Um, I am the voice, and it is great to have you with us. Um, to the uh, to the millions of listeners across this uh, this the planetoid of ours, uh, um, hurtling um, hurtling off into the void, uh, almost randomly, uh, only with some Euclidean sense of direction. I just want to say uh, welcome to the show. Uh, so. Again, uh, I'm going to start rolling some of these found clips. You know, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I will just have to do these out loud. Um, I might have to just refer to my notes. It depends. I'm trying to figure out a way to get a reel-to-reel into the system, and I don't have a reel-to-reel to USB-C adapter. So give me just everybody, just give me a minute. Hey, um, go get some snacks or something. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best idea. Go make, you know what, uh, just, let's just, everybody take, take five, take ten, whatever, whatever you need, take ten. Um, 
I don't know, man. Maybe make some queso or something. But not the stuff with uh, that fake cheese. Was it a Velveeta? Yeah, don't. No, no. No, Velveeta and Rotel, no. Off the books. You're not authorized to do that. What I am looking for is for actual God's honest cheese, man. Cheese. Preferably not the stuff with listeria in it that commonly found in middle America uh, this month. Um, oh, dang it, I'm sorry, Stephen. I told you I wouldn't date the show. Um, God, I can't talk politics either. Oh, God, I'm so angry. Um, okay, uh, again, everybody uh, go make some queso or take your dog on a short walk or... Uh, I don't know, man. Um... You put one of your cats out of their misery with a pillow uh, or something. Uh, whatever you're into, uh, just come back in, I don't know, five, ten minutes, whatever. I don't know, whatever. Look, just just lay the phone down, uh, turn the volume up a little bit, and when you hear me uh, talking again here in a few minutes, just you can come on back. Um, thank you, and um, enjoy the show. The second half of tonight's reading will resume after the intermission in 20 minutes. That scary old gypsy lady told me I had to start working on this because I didn't want to sneak up on me. Um, but she also told me I'd be really good at dream casting uh, upcoming movies. So we're going to go ahead and start with this. Um, man, I hear there's this new movie coming out called Star Wars. I hope it's not as scary as Jaws. My parents should not have taken me to that. I mean, geez, I'm an eight year old kid. Um, so let's see, Star Wars. Who do I want to see in Star Wars? Oh, I want to see some talented veteran Shakespearean uh, British actors yeah 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 um Sir Alec Guinness would make a great Obi-Wan Kenobi I think um gosh Peter Cushing uh he's kind of menacing I think he'd make a great Grand Moff Tarkin um I don't think there's any other uh, choices uh, for Darth Vader than David Prowse. I mean, duh, that's just obvious, and his voice is perfect. Um, let's get a uh, an, an unknown. Um, gosh, uh, maybe if she was related to Tony Curtis somehow. How about um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Fisher, Fisher, Carrie Fisher. That's it. I would cast Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia. And then, oh gosh, so that leaves us the, the two uh, leads, I guess. Uh, Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. It's going to be fun to see who actually gets cast as these two characters. But um, I'd say for Luke Skywalker, we probably want to go with another relative unknown. Um, I'm going to go with Dirk Benedict. And for Han Solo... I think Richard Hatch is probably the best choice I can think of. Okay, I gotta go now. Uh, my parents made hot dogs and uh, 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 green peas for dinner. Hey, everybody. I need to go ahead and apologize up front. Um, this is totally on me. Um, I promised you guys uh, found footage, uh, found audio of me doing... Uh, dream screenings, uh, uh, dream castings for upcoming movies. And I had about 57 of them, but it turns out that I had them all on reel to reel tape. And it turns out that I left those in the garage for 
about the last, let's see what time is it, 8 o'clock, about the last 27 years they've been in the garage. And it turns out that um, I spoke too soon. Um, mice had nested uh, in these tapes. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I've only got uh, one left. And it's just because it's a relatively uh, recent movie. And uh, I was able to use a uh, DAT tape uh, for that. And um, so uh, um, I had that stored in a cool, dry place. Uh, everything is great. And so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and launch. And um, I'm going to play the tape of this last one. So um, uh, please enjoy. And then we will wrap up the show. And I will um, I will free the rest of your nights up to go uh, go have fun, go meet some people, you know, Um, you know, go out and live a little bit. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the idea that people have been busting uh, to get outside the house and stuff for the last two or three years is absolutely true. And I think not only is it a long past time for it, but I think it's incredibly important to get out there and have uh, meaningful human contact. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're not talking about, you know, not FaceTiming, not texting, uh, actually get out there and, and, you know, smell the other people's cologne and, and kind of get jostled around in the crowd and, and just, you know, feel the electricity of, uh, of crowds of people and, and just imagine all the, the creativity and the love and, and, and everything that, that goes with, uh, being around people who uh, you haven't met and so they're not friends yet. Um, so get out there and, um, you know, go, uh, go touch another person's uh, heart, uh, go touch another person's soul, um, go make someone's day a little bit better. And, um, you know, one at a time, uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to heal the world. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, roll the tape now of the dream casting of Dune. So everybody knows that Dune is one of my favorite uh, books of all time. Um, yeah, some people know that. I guess close friends, you know. Um, uh, anyway, so I've been uh, given the chance by the um, uh, uh, the old uh, uh, the old crone, um, the uh, the witch lady. Um, the uh, the gypsy um and i'm sorry i i don't know what other term to use besides gypsy i i truly do not mean to offend so uh for those of you romanis um um you have my love and uh, uh starting starting tonight i'll never use that term again and um and again i love you all right, so uh, casting. Oh man, this is um, this is gonna be tough. Um, there's a lot of major characters that uh, that need to be uh, figured out. I, where do you start? Let's let's go ahead and start with the villain. A good story is only as good as its villain. Am I right? Um, so the villain in this movie, as we well know, is the uh, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, and uh, some uh, pronounce it Harkonnen. Uh, I think that either is correct, Uh, so don't let pedants get in there and get all up in your grill and tell you that it has to be pronounced Harkonnen or Harkonnen. It's a very tomato tomato, um, which is an ironic uh, metaphor considering this movie takes place on a planet where there is no rainfall and, um, uh, you're not going to find any tomato plants of any variety, uh, really. So with that, um, for villain, I'm going to pick a guy I've always loved. Uh, gosh, I hope these, I hope this comes true. Uh, I would love to see Stellan Skarsgård play the Vladimir, uh, Harkonnen's part. Um, he's menacing and, um, uh, he is someone that I think is going to really portray him in a lot more menacing and realistic way than, uh, than we got in the Dune 1984 movie, uh, where that character was clearly just over the top. Uh, I mean, even the director of the movie, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't like that movie. So that tells you what you need to know. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Stilgar, the, uh, the leader of the Fremen, uh, I would pick, I think I would go with, Either Dave Bautista or Javier Bardem. Um, t- 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 
tell you what. Uh, uh, yeah, you know what? I want to. I would like to see uh, Javier Bardem uh, play Stilgar, and Dave Bautista could actually. Um, uh, he could pair up with Stellan Skarsgård, and uh, Dave Bautista could be uh, Glossu Raban, the Beast Raban, uh, who is a, uh, a merciless and heartless uh, killing machine in service of his uncle, uh, the uh, 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 the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, this is starting to take shape a little bit. Um, let's see. To pair with Javier Bardem, um, uh, let's go ahead and say... Um, uh, I realize Gurney Halleck doesn't start... Spoiler alert, sorry. I know Gurney Halleck doesn't start the uh, the story out uh, with Stilgar uh, and the Fremen, um, but he'll get there eventually. Um, uh, this is the one guy that... Uh, he is so good in outer range. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, he was great in Deadpool 2. Um, uh, I honestly can't... He was great in Men in Black 3. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about Josh Brolin. That's the guy I want to see play Gurney Halleck. I think that would be great. Um, okay, uh, who else? Um, I think the... the we got to do uh, Paul uh, Trades, the lead character's uh, parents. Um, I'm going to go with, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that um, uh, Oscar Isaac and Rebecca Ferguson uh, would be the patented uh, dream casting of this movie, man. Uh, those two would both be so good in this. Um, say what you want about, uh, Oscar Isaac and, uh, Moon Knight and, um, uh, and, and uh, no, really feel free, uh, to say what you want about, uh, Moon Knight. Um, I'll get into the whole Disney, uh, Disney plus thing, um, in a moment or two. Um, also it's just, it's just, it's Disney proper, not just Disney plus. Um, but Disney plus is, uh, is not helping the scene any. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson is someone that I've just, I've dug since, um, uh, Oh gosh, how did I not know about her before? It was Mission Impossible Five? I think uh, maybe maybe six, maybe probably both. Uh, anyway, Rebecca Ferguson, she would bring a tremendous gravitas uh, to that role. Um, uh, she would play the Lady Jessica, and um, uh, that's kind of a, a tricky subject that I think uh, Dennis Villeneuve is probably going to handle uh, very effectively and very well by never outright. Uh, talking about this thing, I think one of the things that Villeneuve is going to do really well uh, with this movie, this is just a prediction, is that he is going to um, spend a lot of energy uh, condensing the story and making it visual. Because as we all know in uh, Herbert's book, so much of the story is driven by um, uh, by people's thoughts. Um, you know, without the use of voiceover, uh, the audience cannot be omniscient, um, and so we cannot know what the characters are thinking, you know, unless they tell us. On a printed page, it's uh, obviously very easy. Uh, on a movie screen, it uh, can come over uh, like a Led Zeppelin. Um, Harrison Ford will tell you that. I mean, Harrison Ford might have made a good uh, Han Solo. Um, I may have to go back and revisit that. Of course, that was 30 four years ago, I think, when I taped that, so, I don't know. Um, anyway, whatever, uh, I'll, I'll get back to that later. Um, so, I just, I think that you're going to find that Dennis Villeneuve, the, Villeneuve, the, uh, the most amazing thing uh, about uh, Dune Part 1 is the fact that he will show you things, not tell them. And he is going to be effective enough uh, at the craft of uh, showing you imagery that he is going to communicate the, the uh, greater ideas, um, uh, the, the lessons uh, to be learned um, from the story, from each individual chapter, from, from each, uh, uh, from each uh, interfacing of characters. I think that you're going to see uh, that, that he 
finds a way to use this fairly amazing economy of storytelling uh, that is going to serve Dune uh, incredibly well and in a way that I don't know that anybody could have predicted because it is, you know, we all saw uh, Villeneuve uh, graduated from Blade Runner 2049, an incredibly atmospheric and visual movie. You know, how does he turn that to a book which is so heavy on uh, just, just deep exposition, deep necessary exposition. He is going to uh, basically uh, cast spells as a filmmaker, and um, that's how he's going to communicate this film to the audience. It's going to be incredibly effective, and it's going to be uh, an even more universal experience for the audience, because this movie is going to be so visual. Uh, It's almost like... uh, um, it's almost like a uh, um, a promo. the The first promos, uh, the first trailers you see for a movie, oftentimes are, are labeled international, and you'll notice that they have no dialogue in them whatsoever. It's only music, sound effects, and visuals. And the reason for that is because they don't want there to be any language barrier. They want all seven billion people on a planet to be able to watch this and get the hopefully the same visceral uh um, appetizing uh experience out of this and so i think that that concept uh in a way uh is going to propel uh what i think is going to be a fairly magical uh part one of dune anyway um sorry to finish up here um i think we're down to the the final uh two characters um uh, you know what uh we'll go ahead and throw in um the uh kind of the mad doctor um for uh the baron vladimir harkonnen um his evil scientist um uh, named Piter DeVree, and he's got some of the, the coolest lines, uh, uh, the little the little mantra he tells himself uh, when he is drinking the juice of Safu, which uh, helps him to process intellectually uh, at, at a higher efficiency. Um, I think that I would probably go with... Uh, yeah, David Dalmastian. Yeah, that's yeah. He was good at Ant Man. Um, he has kind of a haunted look to him. I think he might uh, he might do evil uh, scientists really well. Um, I don't know. Maybe they give him some like some like cat eye contacts or something really cool like that. We'll see. I don't know. You know, we're just having fun of this whole exercise. Um, so uh, okay. So the last two characters, uh, Paul and uh, his. Um, his fated love, um, Chani, uh, who is one of the Fremen under Stilgar's care. And um, when Paul uh, has to flee to the desert, um, I I'll, won't go into any more detail there to avoid spoiling as much as possible. Um, but uh, he meets Chani. And he realizes that uh, he has seen her uh, in his precognitive uh, fugues um, for uh, quite a while, and that he basically feels like he's destined to be with her. Um, I can't think of anybody uh, who embodies that spirit more than um, uh, the very, very low-key Mary Jane Watson, uh, played by Zendaya. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and hope that uh, Zendaya, uh, Z- Zendaya, yeah, um, Zendaya. I don't know why I wanted to call her Zendaya. I'm so silly. Uh, Zendaya, uh, we're gonna cast you as Chani, and that leaves uh, the final character, uh, Paul Atreides. And it's, it's interesting because uh, a lot of people uh, don't realize uh, their knee-jerk reaction is that uh, Dune is a story about uh, a white savior. Um, coming to uh, kind of rescue and guide, you know, the indigenous uh, peoples. And that's actually um, not at all what Frank Herbert was trying to say. Uh, Frank Herbert, the author, um, was a a noted ecologist, and uh, he was fiercely uh, protective of the idea of um, sovereign identity for uh, Native American Indians. Uh, Frank Herbert um, spent most of his years in um, uh, Oregon and up and down the, uh, the West Coast, and uh, he always had a, a, a very strong uh, libertarian uh, ecologist streak. Uh, he, um, he, fiercely, um, he fiercely loved um, the, the land, and uh, in fact, the, uh, 
the idea for Dune was created while he was sent out on an assignment to do a story for somebody else. Uh, I think it was on Newsweek, but it was about like the erosion of the sand dunes in uh, um, in Oregon. And uh, the, the the visual was so striking to him that it spurred this idea of a planet that was all Dune. And, uh, you know, the whole thing spun out of that. And, you know, next thing you know, fast forward, you know, to 1986, and he has written six Dune books, uh, which almost literally get better as they go along. Um, uh, if I could um, just go ahead and, and, and drive off into the bar ditch for just a moment. I'll bring us right back. Um, I think I may have shocked, uh, my, uh, my podcast mates, Brad and Frank, when I ranked my personal preference of the original, uh, six Dune books. Uh, I think anything written, uh, after that by, uh, Kevin J. Anderson and, uh, Frank's son, Brian, um, can be considered honorable mention and, uh, possibly not in Canon. Uh, but yeah, probably are. Um, and, uh, the, actually those two guys have written a couple of books that I thought were, um, uh, pretty interesting. I thought the, uh, um, kind of the, uh, the Butlerian Jihad, um, series, the second trilogy written, uh, after the house books, um, I thought the house books, uh, kind of, <sighs> kind of read like a phone book. Um, but uh, I just I I'm not a huge fan of this is a prequel. This is 30 years before the event, so you know everybody you knew in the first movie is a kid in this one. They're all teenagers now, so you know we can get away with casting you know the Say by the Bell kids, and, and we're gonna make a money you know a mint, and it's just uh, I, I've never been a fan of that. So uh, with that said, um, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move into the present here, and. Oh, geez. Um, I don't even know how to finish this thought. So you know what? I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, let's just go ahead and go uh, jump back to uh, Paul Atreides' casting. And um, uh, there's a lot of great actors out there. Um, uh, you know, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon uh, are really, really good. Um, uh, I think somebody like Timothy Chalamet uh, might do a great job. Um, but my dream casting for Paul Atreides, um, yeah, yeah, I think I'm trying to talk myself out of it. I can't. That means I'm on to something here. So my dream casting for, uh, Paul Atreides, and y'all can just follow me and go, duh, when I say this, but yeah, my, my dream casting, Paul Atreides, Muad'Dib, Pete Davidson. Enjoy the movie, everybody. Okay, well, that was a heck of a countdown there. That was a countdown of uh, some of my uh, favorite movie casting, star casting, fantasy movie role playing casting uh, prognostications of the highest mystical and non mystical orders. Sorry, I'm not sure I was finished that title. I don't have my notes with me. Um, my apologies. I I really honestly don't know how I'm going to make it up to each. I, I, uh, okay, let's just break it down for a second here. I kind of feel like I owe each one of you all an apology. And, um, yeah, so, um, look. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how else to do this. Give me a minute here. Let's just get this out of the way. I'm sorry, 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 and I'm sorry. Wow. Um, yeah, that took a while. I wasn't expecting that. It was kind of like, you know... It, what it ended up feeling like was uh, when Andy Kaufman, uh, he does the uh, the appearance at the, uh, the college um, uh, student union, and he ends up reading, oh gosh, I wish I could remember what the name of the book was, but he, he reads like Pride and Prejudice or Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas or I don't know, some, some famous piece of literature, whatever. It's not the point here. The point is that he 
he starts reading this book uh, as people are trickling. Um, uh, as he tells people that's the end of the show, and while you leave, I'm going to go ahead and read this. I think that's how he went. That's how George Carlin did it with the expanded seven words you can't on television in 1985. I know because I was there. I hope I'm not mixing this up with Andy Kaufman. If so, I would be mortified. Anyway, um, no, that's not, hey, 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 whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. That is not to say that I'm, uh, I'm asking you all to leave. That's not, well, that's not the case here at all. Um, uh, I'm just saying, um, okay, you know what? Um, I'm going to, okay, uh, let's see, uh, three, two, one. Okay, that's halftime. So, uh, everybody, uh, give me five or ten minutes. Um, uh, I just need to unwind for a minute. I need to go ahead and um, uh, I need to check my notes, kind of, you know, get myself all combobulated again. And I'm going to go see if I can manage to shovel myself. And um, hopefully I'm going to come back uh, much more gruntled in five-ish minutes. So, uh, okay. Um Go ahead and set the phone down again, and just like last time, we'll just look. I'll start talking at some point, and you can just like come on back and uh, get with me. Um, uh, I'm saving the best for last, uh, so I just want to say um, uh, I love every one of you, and uh, I'm sure there was something important. Oh, what was it? Um, oh, here I go getting angry again. Oh, I've got to stop that. Um, gosh. Uh, it's, it's not anger. It's just frustration. Honestly, I, I really expect to just crush this. And, uh, and and really, up until, to be honest with you, the listener, um, up until about a minute and 11 seconds ago, I think I was. But anyway, uh, you guys just uh, go ahead and have a moment or two to yourselves. Uh, smoke them if you got them, man. And uh, yeah, uh, come on back. Okay. And then we'll get on with the best part of the show. All right, welcome back. Um, how do I, is this the part I have to go back and actually cut professionally? Um, let's see, uh, part of it is a cost benefit analysis. Uh, would it be worth it? Um, are the juices flowing out here? Because again, up until uh, about a minute 11 before the last intermission, I was crushing it. Ah, do I get into it now? Oh, I see. I need my tab. I need my notes. Um, I, I will get into this, and then I may just make some kind of smash cut edit, man, uh, at the house. Um, I, if, can I get serious with you guys? Just a minute. Okay. All right. Let's bring the let's bring the music down. Okay. Let's let's, let's dim the lights. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So I don't know about you guys, but. Am I starting to get worried about Disney? Is there a problem with them or a problem with me? And I ask this uh, in all sincerity. Uh, this is actually not shtick. Uh, um, you haven't heard shtick yet. This is certainly not uh, any of that. Uh, this is not the beginning of the shtickful portion of... Just another fanboy. Uh, mental note, uh, lay in some kind of uh, audio... Uh, uh, audio sounder of Steven's show each time I forget to mention the name of the podcast. Okay, uh, good. Thank you. Um, and resume podcasting. Oh, man. Um, what was I saying? Hmm. Once again, this must not have been very important or I wouldn't have forgot it. Oh, that's right. I was talking about... Um, being worried about Marvel. So, yeah, back to being serious and uh, and dropping the shtick for uh, for one hot minute. I I said at one point, and I'm going to go ahead and stand behind this that I don't think the MCU has had a special movie since Endgame. And I think I was a bigger defender of WandaVision than uh, many people. Um, my uh, Half Hour Wasted counterparts, Brad, Frank, what up? Um, they vehemently disagreed with my conclusions to WandaVision. I found the first three episodes of WandaVision to be intoxicating. And the second three episodes I thought were really, really interesting 
And I thought the third three episodes were frankly a formulaic letdown. Uh, did not enjoy the experience. Uh, I think that uh, they squashed a, a, a bunch of the mystery. Uh, I wasn't satisfied by a lot of their uh, conclusions that it was, you know, it was Agnes all along. It was a very cute uh, little slogan. Um, it, it went viral uh, fittingly. Uh, I think that was a very, very clever uh, little thing to do, a little twist uh, to the proceedings there. Um, but that's the problem. It was a quip. I don't think it served the greater story well to have her be uh, the sole villain of the piece. I think, you know, that's uh, almost paying off a, a red herring. Um, anyway, so WandaVision, I thought, was a noble... Um, uh, it was it was noble and it was uh, better than adequate. Loki is the one thing I would say. And we're going in order here, obviously. Uh, Loki, I think, is the one thing that I would say has been truly special since Endgame. If I had to say, I think Marvel has done nothing special since Endgame except for blank. It is obviously uh, Loki. I think Hawkeye was a really cool show. I thought it was fun um, in a way that uh, I was hoping for. Uh, Marvel, um, they kind of, they used to be known for fun movies, man. They used to be kind of, uh, kind of witty and catty and um, just, just kind of wink, wink. Uh, uh, the, the quips, I think, were welcome at a time when that was still a novelty. Uh, maybe some people might tell you that that it's it's reached a saturation point and that everything doesn't have to be written uh like a comic book and i don't know i, I think that they're comic book movies so uh, as long as they're done well i, I kind of don't care what style you want to do them in anyway so yeah that was that um let's i you know i could keep going but uh, uh the point is made i'm not going to examine uh the the phase four movies uh, i just think they've all been uh odd and flawed and i think uh have been had issues in third acts in every single movie uh, and Doctor Strange, man, I would like to say don't get me started on him, but he is honestly, those who know me know that he is probably in my, he's easily in my top five of uh, comic book properties, uh, I guess, if you want. Um, uh, super quick, uh, Legion of Superheroes, uh, number one uh, by a mile, uh, Fantastic Four, Doctor Strange, uh, and... Um, I would probably say uh, Justice League and Avengers uh, round out uh, those if we're, if we're keeping it in the family. My favorite uh, individual characters of all time, uh, without a doubt, uh, Dick Grayson Robin, OG Robin, and uh, the great Supergirl. Uh, my version is the uh, Dave uh, Cochran, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mike Grell uh, drawn version of uh, Supergirl seen in the early 70s. Uh, specifically, uh, I, you need an example, go check out Superboy starring the Legion of Superheroes issue 204. Uh, the mystery, oh gosh, who is anti lad? You know, who is this? It's the Legionnaire, nobody remembered. Uh, great issue. Anyway, that's my Supergirl. And uh, I uh, defy you to, to show me better. Kind of like, uh, um, like Kate Beckinsale in um, any movie. Um, I dare you to show me better. Or, I don't know. Uh, you know what? Um, for the other side, um, I don't know, man. Uh, uh, let's go with uh, that suave son of a gun. Um, I don't know. You can have Alexander Skarsgård. Okay, how about that? Um, cool. We're all agreed. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. So... My point is that, in my opinion, I haven't found any of these uh, properties uh, to be truly special and kind of inspiring. And, uh, you know, I need to think about this. And holy cats, it, unfortunately, everything is feeling fairly homogenized up to the re-release of, uh, or the release of the second installment in the Doctor Strange uh, um, uh, movie series. And, man, I... Uh, like the first Doctor Strange, um, uh, like when Guardian, like when went into Guardians of the Galaxy, I was literally nervous that this property, which I loved, it'll be like that. When I go to see the Fantastic Four movie, or God willing, a Legion of Superheroes movie someday, I will be nervous AF uh, because I need that movie to fill a a a spot a slot in my soul that's waiting for something like that so um so bring that home so yeah i'll be nervous so I, yes i do 
I do still care enough to be invested. I guess that's the uh, the the right conclusion to draw here, because I'm worried that I'm losing faith in Feige, Marvel, uh, etc., to deliver me something I actually care to spend time at. And I guess I answer my own question. Uh, I still do care. Uh, now, on the other side, I am a completist. Uh, I'm the one who has to watch every episode of Enterprise. Uh, I'm the one who has to watch uh, uh, every episode of Discovery, uh, knowing that I'm likely to be bitterly disappointed by the end of it. I do feel a tremendous loyalty to and a curiosity of uh, the properties that I have uh, previously uh, proclaimed my love for. And uh, I think, you know, anything MCU, uh, anything Trekkie, uh, is, uh, is got an, art of, uh, an automatic lifetime pass. Uh, Star Wars 2, and the, the origination of my rant here a few minutes ago, uh, I'd rather not call it a rant. Let's call it a one-way uh, discussion, like a discussion, like the kind you have with, you know, with your, your teenagers. Uh, that kind of discussion, you know what I mean? Uh, no, we're not asking for, I'm not asking for feedback here. I'm telling you the way the world works. Um, uh, do we even need to start with uh, the storytelling issues in Star Wars? And I will say that uh, The Mandalorian Season 1 and The Mandalorian Season 2 uh, absolutely reignited uh, a fire in my soul. Uh, you know, just of satisfaction and a feeling of, uh, of just being absolutely caressed by uh, the storytelling gods. They weren't perfect, but so, so good. Uh, kind of like Strange New Worlds, boys and girls. Uh, don't sleep on that son of a gun. Mandalorian and Strange New Worlds, two uh, surprisingly good properties. We already knew that about The Mandalorian. We hope that about Strange New Worlds. Turns out it's right about Strange New Worlds. Give it a little bit of slack for being a minor slow burn. Uh, give it four episodes, five episodes. Uh, give it give it through episode five at least uh, before you uh, before you rule on uh, Strange New Worlds. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, anyway, I appreciate that. That uh, aside was sponsored by... Your mom. Uh, next time I do this for you, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm free by the way. I'm free. Like you need me to do this again in like two weeks or whatever. I need to take a week off. This is not easy. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot goes in to making a podcast, an individual uh, episode of a podcast, this special, and this well thought out and this tightly scripted. So all that to say that I need, uh, another blockbuster movie. I was telling this to my buddy, uh, to Buddy Mike, and Buddy Mike was like, uh, uh, Doctor Strange and uh, Spider-Man weren't special, and I'm like, man, okay, now this goes into a whole thing of, uh, do we consider uh, the Sony Spider-Man's uh, canon, and I think for the purpose of this discussion, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll give that, uh, I'll concede the point that uh, the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies are definitely MCU, uh, MCU verse and MCU canon, uh, whereas the, uh, the, the first set with, uh, uh, Andrew and, uh, young Toby, uh, are not, uh, you know, we, we can draw that line there and, uh, move on with our lives. So, yeah, I think they are. Um, but I think much like ironically enough, uh, Sam Raimi did with the, the, the first set, uh, Webb, <laughs> Uh, Mark Webb, the director of the amazing movies with uh, Andrew Garfield, man, he absolutely stuffed it. He he ruined the second one with overstuffing, just like Raimi. Uh, uh, Raimi, uh, you know what? Okay, let me take that back. Webb did not ruin Amazing Spider-Man Two with having crap stuffed into it. Uh, I truly believe that the studio told him to stuff all this extra crap into it, and it was just too overwrought, and you just can't make it work. Or there are some, you know, great single point of failure as far as storytelling goes. Anyway, I think we can all agree it was unsatisfying. Just like the third uh, Spider-Man movie that Raimi did was overstuffed and unsatisfying. The third Spider-Man movie, uh, man, okay, it's actually great. I was, I was pulling your leg, everybody. I wasn't going to say that movie wasn't great. Uh, that movie is freaking great. Uh, but it, it opens up a problem, though, uh, between that and Doctor Strange you're now opening up a multiverse. And so up until this point, this is, man, I'm, it's taken me a while to bring this tugboat back to shore, I guess. But 
up until now, basically, every movie has been in one in one universe, in, in one you know, in one canon, and I think that you know, multiverse movies uh, they can open up a whole new world of possibilities. But the problem is, uh, very obviously, that all of a sudden storylines uh, come cheaply because, like a Rick and Morty episode. Anything can happen at any time because it can come from anywhere in a multiverse where literally anything is going to happen. Uh, it's math. Just, you know, look it up. It's freaking math. Anyway, hey, uh, looks like I am about to get run over by a boat, so I'm going to put the phone down now. And this is either uh, good night and love you guys, you know, or I'm going to uh, come back with an actual wrap it up. Uh, I think maybe I have one more point to get to before uh, we say goodbye. So don't go anywhere. Stick around. Uh, we'll be back right after this. everybody I'm not gonna lie that was a close call out there turns out that boat Somali pirates which is weird on Lake Levon you'd expect probably well-to-do suburbanites or something but <sighs> pirate anyway as I uh, kick off the goodbye portion of this uh, lovely little podcast I want to make sure that uh, Stephen understands um, how grateful I am to him to let me sit in on this uh, hope you all enjoyed uh, Frank's uh, professional broadcast, and I um, uh, wonder if anybody caught the fact that um, I was absolutely channeling my inner Andy Kaufman today. Man, that's uh, it's not easy to do. Um, uh, for the listener, not, not for me. It was easy for me. Um, but I would like to leave you with a couple of thoughts as I wind this down. We've talked about movies. Um, we've talked about uh, Dune. Um, I did some um, pretty amazing um, precognitive. What do we call it? Let's call it uh, dream casting. Yeah, yeah. Let's go with that. Um, and that was a great segment. I'm gonna have to listen back to that. Yeah, that, that might. Uh, I'm gonna have to monetize that. I think. Um, uh, of course, that's only if I can uh, recover that reel-to-reel that was uh, savaged by rodents. Uh, you know, wish me luck. Um, I mean, if uh, people can recover stuff on damaged hard drives, they can probably do that to a, a reel-to-reel. I mean, right? How hard can it be, honestly? Um, but uh, for me, um, two of the things I love most in life, uh, comic books and music. And um, the comic book thing is actually fairly easy. Uh, I think it's interesting that comic books right now are in a very weird state. You know, we've been predicting the demise of comic books for a generation now. And honestly, the uh, direct-to-market uh, uh, concept has not been kind to the, uh, the, the mom and pop and, and kid uh, readers. Uh, I think that comics would be so much better off if you could find them at a spinner rack again. But you can't put Baxter paper on a spinner rack. You know, you've got to uh, have more respect for, you know, that, that great paper. Hey, my thought is uh, put it back on newsprint again, kids. Um, we can read uh, it on beautiful, white, glorious, glamorous, glossy paper in the trades. Um, make those things uh, make those things cheaper. Uh, get them into the hands of uh, the next generation that's actually going to support the industry. Um, as opposed to watching it uh, die a slow death. Uh, it's interesting to, uh, as, as I, uh, for the last few years, I've approached the comic industry through the eyes of someone who has got both Marvel Unlimited and uh, DC Universe Infinite. And that is now how I uh, work through my comic addiction. So I'm a few months behind um, just because of the way the app works. I totally get it. You know, they would still like you to go to the comic book store and buy that uh, issue that you just cannot wait to read. 
Uh, and I have actually done that. I've gone and I've purchased a uh, Doctor Strange comic here and there. I've uh, um, tried to keep up with uh, the Legion of Superheroes run, even though um, Bendis' you know, most recent version of it ended uh, months ago now. Uh, maybe close to a year, considering the uh, the the time uh, time jump between uh, in person and uh, what you get on the app. Uh, anyway, uh, I always want a reason to go to a comic book store. Uh, I just have fewer and fewer of them these days, uh, thanks to those uh, those glorious glorious apps. And as I uh, approach my mid fifties, I find that uh, my eyes really appreciate uh, something that's backlit. And something that I can turn the brightness up on if I need to. Um, you know, the only downside of the tab is that you can't read outside. I can live with that. I'm probably not taking my comics outside because after all, they're printed on high-quality Baxter paper. I know it's not Baxter, but you know what I mean. It's that that nice, you know. It's really honestly, um, it's, it's not better than the medium deserves. But I think it induces a price point into comics just built in that is always uh, going to continue to make it difficult for um, the six-year-old kid like I was uh, to, you know, get into it and to really fall in love. And of course, you know, comics were more innocent back in those days. Um, So it was just, it was never an issue. Now, you know, a a good parent probably does need to at least look over their kid's shoulder at the comic book store and make sure, you know, what they're getting is something that's not going to scar them for life. Or make them grow up way too fast. Anyway. Um, so one thing I think it's odd is that um, uh, DC especially seems like they have uh, uh, relatively few titles uh, these days. If you look week to week. Um, some of the most interesting titles that uh, DC uh, has come out with, though, uh, have turned out to be um, the comic equivalent of a miniseries. Uh, they're not intended to be ongoing necessarily. Um, I've got to say that one of my favorite titles of the last number of years now is, uh, something written by, uh, NK Jemison, uh, Jemison, sorry, I'm doing this off the top of my head. Um, the far sector, uh, arc that introduces, uh, Joe or Sojourner Muline, uh, as a brand new green lantern character, I think is fantastic. It's really cool. It's a, uh, it's a mystery. Uh, I really dig uh, the introduction of uh, Joe Moline's character. Uh, I think what they've done with her and they have made her a different Green Lantern. I will not go any further uh, into it. Um, so you can find out yourself. You can go on your own journey. But if you've got, you know, DC Universe Infinite, man, they need to trim that name down. Uh, give Far Sector a shot. Absolutely. Um, I also think that, uh, oh, oh, and far, one, one last note of Far Sector, which it just, honestly, I've gone back and I've reread it um, uh, twice. So I've I read the entire series three times total. And it's only been out for like a year. Um, it's just, uh, for some reason, that just hits all the right notes with me. I, I love the, the sci-fi high concept. Um, I will say that uh, the setting of the book happens uh, uh far sector is aptly named as it happens basically on the other side of the universe which is such a cool concept um for me uh i i just i love to imagine the idea of being you know in a in a galaxy you know 1500 galaxies over and to the left a little bit uh just being you know way way the heck out there uh so it's really cool uh far sector is i think my favorite single title of the last number of years other than anything that Jonathan Hickman touches. And I know that's a Marvel thing. I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, Another title, which I, uh, is growing on me. Uh, I actually had to force myself to get through the first couple of issues and it's not over yet. I mean, it probably is. Uh, if you go and pick these up in the, uh, uh, in the LCSs, but, uh, uh, I am working my way through Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, uh, which I think uh, is written by Tom King, if I remember right. And I've not read Tom King's uh, fairly controversial, uh, as far as I know, uh, run on Batman. So I don't know a whole heck of a lot about Tom King, uh, but I really enjoy what he has done with the character of Supergirl. And I really dig Supergirl's plucky little sidekick. 
Um, and it's also a, a story that is not intended to be ongoing, I don't believe. And uh, like Far Sector, it's also a title that, uh, excuse me, Far Sector, uh, Far Sector, I think, takes place over a few days or a few weeks. Uh, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, uh, there are months uh, uh, in between issues um, as far as the development of the characters and the, the timeline of the story and all that stuff. Uh, it's just a really cool idea. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of... It's the kind of adventure you would almost expect uh, to be part of a classic literature, which is probably you know, Tom's idea. It was probably his, his thoughts uh, in trying to spin something that uh, feels kind of timeless. Anyway, um, the, uh, the third thing uh, is DC, they have... Um, uh, the, the way DC is doing their books right now is really interesting to me, too. Because you've got a lot of these titles, especially Justice League, I'll, I'll, I'll pick out in particular. You know, again, as we talked about earlier, Justice League is, is a top five title to me. It's the kind of thing I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a completist. I'm going to read it no matter what. So I'm in. But they are having these issues. And maybe this has to do with trying to balance out the, the, the current price points. Um, but they'll have a full length uh, Justice League story and then they'll back it up with a 10 12 issue uh, Justice League Dark Adventure uh, and both of these stories are continuing uh, through the titles uh, I, I find that a pretty cool way to go because I don't honestly know what the price tag on the cover of a, a recent Justice League comic is but you are getting two comic books uh, in one wrapper and um, cool stuff. Um, interesting ideas coming out of the world of comics these days. Uh, I do feel really bad for uh, some of those artists um, who are having to deal with the, the whole Warner Brothers thing and, and you know, the, the poor DC guys getting moved out of their offices and, and it just, uh, you know, basically moving into a, a WeWork, uh, you know, a facility. Uh, it just it's so weird. I, I hope that that the creators of these comics are well taken care of financially and that, uh, that they're able to find an honest, real peace with uh, the way the industry is right now. Um, I guess it's a good thing that uh, comics, especially in the age of the Internet, uh, is truly something you can do from home. Uh, a lot of artists have been doing that for a generation or two now, and they made it work through the mail. So, you know, obviously you can do that uh, uh, with drop boxes and one drives and stuff like that. Uh, seems to work out fairly well for everybody as far as the quality of the, the comics that are being put out, uh, even if I wish there were more physical titles. Um, one... DC title, uh, last thing I'll mention, um, uh, for DC, um, okay, two things I'm going to mention, uh, I can't say enough good things about, uh, about the Green Lantern, uh, the current ongoing is really interesting, and I'm invested, they've introduced yet another, uh, uh kid Green Lantern character, and much like, uh, Far Sector, this is not a normal Green Lantern with a normal power ring. And I just, I find it uh, pretty fascinating that, that these, uh, these evolutions in the whole Green Lantern method um, is changing rapidly. Uh, so, you know, good for DC for not being stagnant. I've never been one of those. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, um, comics came out with... Uh, you know, it wasn't just capes and tights. You know, comics were westerns. Comics were war comics. Uh, uh, comics were uh, were mystery and horror. And and you know, you had so many different uh, genres of comic books. And that has, for the most part, especially if you're you're mainly concentrating on the big two, which is what I do, um, then you just you know pretty much everything is is you know capes and tights and and uh punching bad guys out and and outsmarting lex luther and dr doom and stuff like that but uh dc has started reintroducing um so-called uh, horror titles or at least mystery uh titles and 
I am absolutely fascinated. Again, I'm probably a few months behind real time. I, I've heard that uh, the, the, the first season, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, paused and there was a few month gap uh, before they pick up with, with the so-called season two. But uh, a title right now that I uh, can't wait for Mondays when the, uh, the, the titles refresh weekly uh, on the app is The Nice House on the Lake. Uh, I'm sorry, again, I'm doing this off the top of my head, and I wish I could remember the creators of it. Um, it's uh, interesting art, um, fairly dirty, sketchy artwork, uh, as, as a lot of titles are kind of going uh, to these days. It's, it's, it's fairly uh, raw artwork, uh, which is interesting. You know, I, I come from a world where uh, I think that you know, as a kid, you know, really nothing was better than John Byrne and Terry Austin, you know, clean lines and, and, you know, just, just very beautiful artwork to look at and, and artwork in a lot of uh, books these days, uh, you would not say it's beautiful to look at. Uh, it's interesting. Um, it's, uh, probably indicative of the current age we live in, whatever that means, but it's just, it's art that works with the story. Um, there's really only a few artists these days uh, that do work that, that I have a hard time dealing with. Uh, one of them, I'm sorry, is uh, Riley Rosmo. I just, I have a hard time getting into his art. Um, I'm sorry, I'm assuming Riley is a guy. Um, but, uh, and I don't mean to dump on him. Uh, it's just a style of art which doesn't quite jive with me. But, uh, you know, so many do, and I, I don't mean to put him down. Anyway, um, So yeah, Nice House on the Lake is a post-apocalyptic mystery, if you will. Uh, I find it uh, uh, incredibly dense thematically, and uh, it's just, it's really well done. And it surprises me that that, uh, I kind of latched onto this, because again, I've just, I've never, literally never been into... Uh, the non capes and tights superhero uh, stuff. So it's kind of cool uh, for me to enjoy um, going out and uh, uh, finding something new. Um, uh, it, it makes me honestly, it does make me want to go to the LCS and start picking up uh, non big two titles because I know that content like that is out there. Um, and I know that uh, it's, it's top shelf stuff. Uh, I just need to go connect with it. Uh, anyway, uh, what I was going to say about uh, Green Lantern was uh, one of my favorite uh, titles in the last uh, couple, three years. Um, I've always been, you know, a, I'm, as a Frank Herbert fan, I've always been kind of a Grant Morrison junkie, a Jonathan Hickman junkie. I, I love the huge, big concept, you know, turn, you know, turn what you expect on its head and then put it in a blender. Um, what he did, he and, and Liam Sharp, Good gravy, Liam Sharp is amazing. Uh, I think right now he is either working on or just finished uh, Batman Reptilian. Um, and I don't know how someone does art like that and is able to turn a, a book out monthly. It, it just seems like, you know, what he's doing is this art, the, the care that he puts into it, the detail, uh, it should take uh, weeks or months to put together, you know, 20 pages of this stuff. I'm just, I'm stunned, uh, watching his art. And, and of course, Grant Morrison's just absolute built in bizarrity. I know I just made that word up. Um, it's okay. You can use it. Um, yeah, Grant Morrison, Liam Sharp, man, they killed it on, uh, the green lantern title, which we got two seasons of, uh, two 12 issue runs. Uh, great stuff. I wish that, uh, Grant would put out more mainstream comic stuff, uh, because, uh, you do it, Grant. I'm there, buddy. Uh, as far as Marvel goes, um, I am not as in love with the Fantastic Four as I used to be. I will always be madly in love with them as characters. And, um, uh, I am waiting for, uh, Dan Slott to either grab me by the scruff um, or 
Uh, although now he did have a, a really cool arc uh, as they went, um, uh, the Fantastic Four went to a, a, a planet in a galaxy far, far away, and uh, Johnny Storm uh, ended up becoming soulmates with uh, with someone from a society that uh, uh, the Fantastic Four had gotten with. You know, okay, no spoilers, um, but um, the Fantastic Four has had a couple of good uh, little mini arcs within this first forty some odd issues uh, that are out right now. I don't love it as much as I loved uh, Hickman's run or uh, Mark Miller's. Uh, that was for you, Brad and Frank. Uh, Mark Miller. Um, but mainly what I have loved in Marvel uh, for the last uh, number of years now uh, are the X-Men titles. I think what uh, Jonathan Hickman did uh, to them uh, was just amazing. The whole, the the concept, the kind of in a Grant Morrison vein of just upending everything you ever thought you could possibly know about the way this particular universe revolves. Um, for Grant, uh, excuse me, for uh, Hickman to introduce uh, the, the concept of Krakoa and the concept of um, regeneration and the fact that it's not just regeneration, there are clearly going to be um, repercussions down the line uh, based on the concept that uh, the, 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 the mutants are not immortal but they they are they can be resurrected um uh, actually fairly easily uh so you've gotten to a point where mutants know that uh death is not the end for them that they will uh come back uh much like let me bring this tugboat back to dune here uh, almost exactly in the way that uh, Golas were revived in uh, the, the later Dune books, um, Duncan Idaho uh, predominant uh, among them, uh, where you will grow a new body and then you take the uh, original memories and you implant them into this new shell and you are essentially uh, resurrected. Um, uh, really interesting concept, uh, especially combining that with the fact that this is not supposed to be a good thing long term because of what it can do to a society uh, that knows that uh, it can't die. Um, the way that uh, a society could stagnate, uh, the way that it could um, that it could twist and mutate, uh, no pun intended. Um, the, the great tragedy is that even though there are a number of uh, really uh, Top shelf uh, creators, uh, Jerry Dugan, Teeny Howard, um, other names I'm, I'm missing, um, that are working with Hickman and have taken up the mantle since Hickman left to go to Substack. Um, I just think the uh, the X Men run and all the X Men titles are absolute. I uh, they're the first things I go to when uh, when Marvel comes out and. Um, and I try to savor every single episode and every single uh, adventure of uh, the the X Men family of books these days. So uh, I think um, uh, that's that's what I'm really digging in the uh, the comic book world these days. Um, finally, honestly, finally, uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to go into uh, I wanted to do some music. I wanted to do a freaking music episode. However, uh, Stephen informed me uh, at the last moment that uh, he uh, does not, in fact, have an ASCAP or a BMI license. So it would be disastrous um, for the YouTube algorithms and, uh, and, and you, know, you know, piracy concerns and you know, stuff like that um, for me to actually play any kind of real music. In fact, uh, that is why um, I have not been able to deliver unto you, the, uh, the kind, good listener, uh, an audio tweet. Because I can't roll out the, uh, the Elastica, um, the, the great song Connection by Elastica. You know, so you know what I'm talking about. It's, you know, it says, you know, I go, hey, it's time for Bill's audio tweet. And then the music starts and it's like... Dun, 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 dun. And then yeah, it goes a little further, and then yeah, boom! Bill's audio Twitter. Don't 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 don
and then the music fades out and then then i my voice comes up and i say something quippy like uh half hour wasted more like full hour wasted <laughs> and then the music kicks in boom kind of fades out and uh, kind of i look at brad and frank and you know they kind of look at me with um, uh, these it's always hard to tell whether it's disapproval or just surprise uh, in any case um so um, sorry about the, uh, the no audio tweet. Um, I just, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to get the, uh, the internet gatekeepers to crash down on just another fanboy. So, uh, what I will do is I'm going to just kind of, uh, uh, I'm going to offer you guys up. I'll send this to uh, Steve as well. Um, hopefully uh, link can get through. Hopefully it's uh, easy for people to pick it up. But if you guys have got Spotify, uh, I have created, uh, I have cribbed together a, a playlist of songs. Uh, the idea is that uh, with very few exceptions, um, almost nobody listening to the show right now has ever heard of any of these bands. Um, that's the whole idea. Uh, the concept that you guys might be able to pick up, uh, some new music that you never heard before. Uh, I'm into some odd stuff these days. Um, I've always, uh, I've always kind of been a, a fan of, uh, Lush. Uh, I'm, I'm not into pop. Like you're not going to catch me listening to, you know, Olivia Rodrigo or Billie Eilish or, you know, uh, the Backstreet Boys or anything like that, but you will find me listening to uh, groups like uh, Brother Tiger and Tora Wee Moi and Unknown Mortal Orchestra and Pond and uh, Lily Konigsberg, Monster Rally, Mid, Robert Glasper, uh, Jay Orbison, Leah Sen, Young Bay, Channel Trace, a particular favorite of mine, uh, Jitwam, the great Donnie Benet, uh, Cartoons, Ray Khalil, Rome Fortune, uh, people like that. Um, so I have cobbled together a, uh, eh, relatively short playlist. Uh, does it say how long it is? It says one hour, six minutes long. So you guys get a nice long jog in while listening to weird music you never heard before. So I'm going to go ahead and put this playlist entitled or what <laughs> or what, uh, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that, um, uh, I'm going to put that out as a link uh, included with the show, assuming that uh, Stephen is good with that. And uh, if uh, nothing else, uh, all the playlists that I have in my Spotify account, uh, I keep public. And you all are more than welcome to go peruse the friggin' thousand playlists I've created. And uh, good luck if you do. But uh, this one is entitled, Or What? Question mark. So um, please enjoy and uh, feel free to uh, uh, add to it, enhance it. Um, uh, and with that said, bring the music up. It is time to say goodbye for now. And I think this has gone so well, though, that uh, I'm pretty sure that Steven is probably going to ask me to be a permanent co-host of the show. So I'm going to need a week off after this uh, exhausting exercise in creating a podcast. But... I'll look forward to be back in, uh, with you guys in a, in a couple of weeks, and um, yeah, uh, I know I just I just have a feeling Stephen's going to love this idea. I, I I bet you all will too. So you know, keep the home fires burning. Feel free to just just uh, you know crush the like button and, and 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 ring that bell and let Stephen know that uh, that you want no you need a lot more voice in your life. Until then, peace and love and harmony to every single one of you. And I will look forward to next time. Hugs and kisses, everybody. Mm-hmm.